Hi everyone, happy spring. I think it's actually gonna feel like spring out here this weekend. Yeah, well we've been waiting a long time. We have, it is supposed to be a gorgeous weekend. Even better next week, nice and nice temperatures next week. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a nice fun program warmer. for you today. We're talking about, like I said, now spring feels like it's really on the way. Mm -hmm. I've got several colorful trees and shrubs primarily that you can add to your landscape to really brighten things up. Absolutely. And how appropriate with the, the cherry blossoms coming into a peak bloom this well, weekend? Well, that's, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking. But you think about how the last couple of years when the blossoms have already bloomed out by right. the end of March. <laughs> exactly. So it's really nice that things have worked out here right as their peak bloom. That's We're going to be right. talking about cherry trees. That's right. I'm going to try to get down there tomorrow myself and you know, take in great. some of that the yeah. beauty. It's I went there for my first time last year, believe it or not. I was born in D.C. I've been here all my life. It wasn't until last year I got down that to was see me. it. It was about four or five years ago but for the first time that I got down there, yeah. too. Same but way. Born and bred here. Now it's on the to-do <laughs> list. Absolutely. Yeah. And later on in the show, we will be taking your phone calls, so save those up if you have any questions. <clears throat> Before we get started, let you know what's happening at Maryfield Garden Center this weekend. Our seminars are up this weekend. Um, this weekend they're going to be at Fair Oaks and Gainesville. We are finished with the ones at the Maryfield location. So at Fair Oaks today at 10 a.m., Peg Beer is going to be talking about container gardening, and that is so appropriate. Everybody is just itching to get their containers planted and be able to enjoy the beauty on your deck, patio, or throughout your landscape. So 10 a.m. today at the Fair Oaks location. At 10 a.m. today at our Gainesville location, Renetta Holt, who's been on several times, will be talking about fragrant gardens. So if you'd like some nice fragrance in your landscape, this is the seminar for you. 10 a.m. at the Gainesville location. And our Sunday seminars are in full swing now. So at our Gainesville location tomorrow, Sunday, uh, Cynthia Brown, who's the Smithsonian Garden Special Education Manager, uh, uh, Manager of Collections and Education. That's a big title she's got there. But she's great, and she's going to be talking about using edibles in containers. Now, we, you actually see two listed there, 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. Our Sunday seminars are basically at 1. We had a little proof reading uh, mistake there in our when we printed our seminar schedule, so it listed it at 10. So Cynthia was nice enough to say, hey, I'll do both of them. So at 10 and 1 tomorrow, you can learn all about using edibles in containers. Yeah, and I have to say, that's going to be a lot of fun. Cynthia's been here on the TV show with us before, mm -hmm. and she loves uh, not just growing the vegetables and herbs, but she loves cooking with them, so I think it's kind of interesting. She'll that's give great. you ideas of not just how to incorporate these in your landscape and make beautiful containers, but also how to put them to work in the oh, kitchen. That's great. Oh, and, you know, they're so popular now. You know, everybody wants to use edibles, you know, throughout, you know, you don't have to have a big garden anymore, you know, you can just take a small little pot or, you know, something outside your, your kitchen on your deck and you Exactly. Ready to go. Uh, yeah, C Cynthia will show you in her own landscape. She's got a townhouse backyard, but uh, the whole thing is landscape with edible plants. And as That's Debbie was great. saying, hey, just just all you need is a, a, a good enough sized flower pot, a window box, and you can be at growing vegetables and herbs Super. and fruits and all these kind of fun things. It's great. It's great. Okay, and then next weekend we will have just at the Gainesville location on Saturday we will be having a, Robert Woodman's going to be talking about attracting birds and butterflies, which is all is a great seminar and on Sunday uh, Steve Gable is going to be talking about gorgeous start gorgeous gardens that are deer resistant so that's a very important topic for all of us around here so the seminars will continue through the month of April so take advantage of that and of course you can see there maryfieldgardencenter.com you can get the entire schedule on our website also wanted to mention tomorrow at our Fair Oaks location April 7th our friends at the Arlington Rose Foundation will be having their, their monthly meeting, and they're going to be having a seminar, and it's entitled Feeding Hungry Roses. So one of their great rosarians are going to be talking about that. It's free to the public, even going to have light refreshments, which is always nice. So take advantage of that. That's at 2 p.m. at our Fair Oaks location tomorrow. So it's rose season, too. You have time to get everything growing. Yeah, it all happens at once. I and know. I tell you, I, we go to these, and I'm always amazed at how much we have going on at the garden center all the time. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's get started. Well, I keep saying the big story this year has been, is it spring yet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, finally, I think we can say yes. I think so. 
it is. By just a couple pictures, um, not that we really need reminders. Ah! Um, <laughs> but yeah, this was taken no, March no. March 25th. That was less than two weeks ago. That oh, was only about goodness. 10, 11 days ago, taking a look down in our tree section. And you can see we are ready for spring. Mm -hmm. uh, we, that's just our tree section out there at Fair Oaks. And really, as far as the eye can see, we're just uh, loaded up with gorgeous trees. And then I went out there this past Tuesday tried to take the same picture from the same spot. So I just thought it was kind of funny uh, to look at the contrast and see what a difference a week makes Ugh. there. So finally, like I said, we put together a nice weekend where we've got, you know, Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. and it sounds like Monday it even gets nicer. Oh, so we yeah. finally put together a nice weekend here. And wait till all those, you see those trees there, wait till they're all greened up. We'll have to take a picture of that same yeah. spot oh, that's what in I'm a couple of weeks. That is exactly <laughs> my intention. I've marked that spot and we're going to follow yep. it for a little while. <laughs> Uh, but so that's why I say, is it spring yet? Well, and the answer is kind of yes and no. Uh, well, I've got my next picture is just trying to show what we call the average frost dates. Uh, so depending where you live geographically, this will move a little bit, and there's also microclimate. So it's not an exact date. But where we're using is our average frost date is April 20th to April 30th in that range uh, for where we live. So the thing is, um, yes, it's spring. We've got this beautiful weekend, and we want to go out there and work in the garden, and I encourage you to make the best of it. Right. But, you know, we're really not out of the woods yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we can still have some chilly evenings and everything. So if you are planting anything tender out there, you need to be prepared mm -hmm. to cover it. Just put a light frost blanket or something. Right. But the thing is, my real message here today is there are so many gorgeous things that you can be planting now which are totally completely frost tolerant hardy. This is a, an example from our annual section. Mm -hmm. Of course, pansies um, are a, what we call no-brainer around right. the garden center because they will live right through the winter time here. That's definitely a cool season annual. Uh, they look really great usually right up until about June time period. There's also in here what's called osteospermum or sometimes I call blue-eyed daisy. Uh, that's a cool season annual. They do their that's best. That's the one at the top here. Yeah. Right, and they do their best in this in spring, and then really pick up vigor again. And with the fall and mobilia that's in there, and we've got snapdragons and a sweet alyssum, and the list goes on and on. So if you come into the garden center in the annual section, you're going to find lots of beautiful color that you can put out there and just not just survive, but thrive mm -hmm. under these cool temperatures. Now you also, um, stepping in the annual section, of course, there's plenty of vegetables and herbs, and we've talked about this, but these are all examples of cool season vegetables, which again, these like the cool temperatures. They really don't tolerate the heat very well. So we're talking about anything from lettuce in here to parsley, kale, I've got a little bit of broccoli, some bok choy, beets, um, and this just a small selection that's in there. So my point here is you do want to get out there and you do want to get planting. You just need to be a little thoughtful on what right. you plant. And of course, our people and experts are there to help you. Super quick, because I don't want to neglect the perennial section, because <laughs> we're talking about trees and shrubs today, so I wanted to try to represent everybody at the garden center. We have plants like the dianthus or carnations that are in there. Um, and I just brought s examples of several varieties. We can get a quick little picture in here. Uh, and I have more, but we're just going to run out of time to show them. But these are commonly called pinks, um, same, same group as carnations are in there. These are tough, hardy perennials that live year after year, but they bloom their best now in early spring and again towards late fall because uh, they really love the cool temperatures. So mm -hmm. it's, I'm going to say spring is here, come in, shop with us, beautiful color. But um, if you have any questions, ask yeah. any of our plant specialists about what's safe to put out right That's now right. and what you might want to hold off Especially with. Especially this year. You know, the, the temperatures are a little crazy. So we're going to take a quick break, and we will be right back with some colorful trees and shrubs. back we're talking about colorful trees and shrubs today and we've got some great ideas for you 
Well, I thought we kind of go sort of in a sequence of blooms, okay. starting with some of the earliest bloomers and then work our way through. Good idea. Down the season. So with that in mind, I'm going to begin by looking at magnolias. Uh, and specifically the first one we're going to look at here is what's called a star magnolia. Uh, well, let's see, that's a saucer magnolia. Do we have one before that one? That's the one I want to talk about. We'll get this, the other one will get its turn <laughs> coming that's up right. here. But this really is probably one of the first, maybe the earliest of flowering trees or what I would call spring. We, of course, we do have some that bloom in the winter time, but I'm gonna say this welcomes the spring. Uh, again, I think this has been a fantastic year for them. Last year, when we were looking at 80 degrees in March, you know, we had everything blooming out in March, and this is one of these trees that frequently, if it blooms too early, it gets followed and hit by frost, and then it kind of uh, takes away from the floral display. So right now, these are in full bloom today, uh, and it's kind of nice with their cool weather this spring. It's sort of held off, it's flowering a little bit. But you can see it makes a, um, um, I'm gonna call medium-sized tree in the landscape. You know, we're talking about 25, 30 feet tall. Uh, with time, I've seen them actually get larger. But they just get loaded with these beautiful strap-like flowers that are in there. There's a few different varieties. And you're gonna see basically white going to a light pink color. So again, if you like to get that early spring color going in your garden, there's, this is a great way to really kick off the season. They're beautiful. So that's the um, star magnolia, or magnolia stellata, and the next one is what we call the uh, saucer magnolia. On here, you can see the, flower, the tree looks similar from a distance, uh, but these saucer magnolias do tend to get a little bit larger than the star magnolia, and the flowers themselves are larger in their um, just just larger in their size. It will. It's also an early spring bloomer. They're probably going to start opening up sometime this week or maybe already. But it it usually comes in about a week behind the star magnolia. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is uh, there's several varieties that are out there available to you. But the National Arboretum uh, many years ago recognized a couple things limiting use of this tree. One is sometimes they bloom so early in the season that they get nipped by the frost. And the other is our properties tend to get smaller uh, and these are large trees. They thought, well, if I could come up with a magnolia that bloomed a little bit later, stayed a little bit smaller, that it would have a lot of appeal to, to home right. small residential landscapes. So they introduced uh, many years ago a series that are called the Little Girls. And that's one of them in this picture coming up here is a variety that's called Jane. Uh, so Jane is still probably, oh, two, maybe even as much as three weeks, depending on the weather, away from flowering. Uh, she's gonna mature probably at about uh, 12, maybe 15 feet tall. So this is great that you can actually add the early spring color of a magnolia, even if you feel a little, little bit limited on space, uh, and it takes it outside the risk of the frost state. And there's things like Jane, Betty, Elizabeth, they all have those type of names. And really the difference between them goes into their flower color. So you've got several choices that are there. So again, that would be a nice addition. And this last of the magnolias, and I'm going through just some of the popular ones. Of course, magnolias will keep flowering for you well through into the summertime. But this is one that's called butterflies. I just love that creamy yellow blossom. Again, it's gonna be coming on, it's probably still three, four weeks away from flowering. Mm -hmm. So again, we're kinda of going in the sequence of blooms. So with magnolias, you know, you've got a range of colors, sizes. Every, all that you're looking at here are deciduous. They shed or drop their leaves during the winter time. But then of course you can start talking about southern magnolias, our native sweet bay magnolia, and the list goes on and you get almost uh, continuous color all summer long. Uh, so if you if I had room, I'd have one in my landscape. There but you, go. you know, you got to make choices. Houses, yep, you got to make choices. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's just a quick plug on magnolias, and you got to mm -hmm. come down to see all the rest of them. Absolutely. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, uh, start into a different group of early spring blooming trees. I want to talk a little bit about service berry. I noticed on my way in to work this morning, mm -hmm. service berry have yes. opened up into their full bloom right now. Uh, service berry is in the foreground and you can see the weeping cherry in the background there. Uh, so the service berry there is, is a native tree. Uh, there's two or three varieties, but they do grow naturally here in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area as a nice woodland tree, early bloomer. 
And just like in the background, you can see that weeping cherry, it is also in the rose family. So cherries and roses, I mean cherries and uh, service berry, close relatives, similar in some of their flowering characteristics. So the service berry opens to that cluster of small white blooms. Uh, you can see it up close in there. And then those flowers mature into that pretty red berry. That red berry ripens into sort of a deep plum color. And it is edible. It's very sweet and tasty, but it's fantastic for wildlife. The wildlife come and grab all, all that berries up. So the, the berries mature usually towards June. So June berry is another common name for it. We call mm -hmm. it service berry, uh, June berry, I think um, sh shad blow or something is another common name. So this goes <laughs> by several different names. So the plant has a lot of qualities to it beyond just its flower characteristics. Now what happened to us last year, a lot of people grow this because it's great to attract wildlife and birds, but they got attacked by a disease, a fungal disease. It's called, um, uh, this is the hawthorn, hawthorn uh, cedar rust. So what'll happen with rust diseases, they have what you call an alternate host relationship. So this forms a large gall on junipers and then it spreads from the juniper into plants in the rose family. And this was so widespread last year, it really destroyed the, um, the fruiting qualities. So if you had problems with that, there are a couple things you can do to treat it, but you need to do that preventatively. And that's sort of a uh, point I wanted to make this morning. If you're going to be treating for that rust disease, you want to do that now. You want to do that while the flower buds are starting to swell and enlarge, by the time you see the problem, it's too late to treat it. Right. So you could go out there, take a close look, and if you're in the bud stage or starting to bloom, this would be a good time to treat it either with Mancozeb or the Immunox Plot or the Immunox there you can see, or if we can get a good look there at that. There we go, move them over a little bit. Those are both good choices of fungicides you could use to control the rust. Now, I don't think we're going to have as much trouble with it this year. Again, every year is different. Last year, we were in the 70s and 80s, and it was warm, and it was moist, and rust went crazy. Right. This year, it's kind of the exact opposite weather conditions. So it's hard to tell exactly what's going to happen, but you could go out and treat now if you had problems that last year and just be on the safe side. Great. That's the nice thing about gardening. Something's always different, always something to be on yeah. the lookout for. So <laughs> we're going to take a quick break and come back uh, with more ideas. David's actually going to go into our little virtual garden. We'll be right back. Welcome back everybody to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. In our last segment we talked a little bit about magnolias kind of being some of the first ones to open up followed by serviceberry and of course what a perfect time to be talking about cherries uh, because we're just fortunate enough we've got a gorgeous weekend here and it's going to coincide right with the blossoming of the cherries all around the tidal basin and these are such popular plants in our landscape for such good reason. Uh, There's so many to choose from, first of all. Uh, I'm just hitting on some of the more popular varieties that are out there. If I'm kind of truly follow sort of my sequence of blooming, there's things like the Okami cherry and Autumn Alice cherry, which is already in bloom. Uh, they've been doing some hybrids with that. We've got a new one at the garden center that's called Acoma, uh, which has these beautiful little pink blossoms on it. So there are several others out there. They've actually done some hybridizing in plants like First Lady, which is an upright variety in spring blooming. But those are, um, I just didn't have time to bring them all in here. So I just try to make the point there's many of them to choose from. You need to come in the garden center and get all the details on that. But this is the Yoshino cherry. Uh, this is the one that's probably best known to you. This is the one that's most, um, it's widely planted around the tidal basin. And it flowers right now, this weekend, first weekend of April. And again, a lot of these are things that we tend to really grab your attention because these are trees and they bloom in early spring. They're flowering first. And then after that, it's followed with the leaves. So the blossoms just really stand out. And of course, this happened to be on a beautiful, gorgeous, sunny day with blue skies, just like we're gonna have coming up here this weekend. So that's the Yoshino cherry. Uh, and then we'll get a look at the flower. Uh, 
another look there. Okay, this is Yoshino Cherry. We'll get my pictures a little bit out of sequence at the garden center. But in front of that are the purple leaf plums. Uh, you can see the plums are in flower right now, and then uh, the cherries come in right behind them. So that's our Yoshino Cherry. And now we're going to get a close up look at the flower. Cool there. So the Yoshino is the one that has the single white blossom on it. The trees can get a little bit larger. When I say that, they have that kind of spreading habit you saw on the earlier slides. And they are um, probably going to peak out at about maybe 30 feet tall and about 25 feet wide and just that beautiful light airy look about them. Now as soon as they finish blooming, uh, in another week or two, we're going to start to see the Kwanzaa cherry, which is another very popular variety come into bloom. The Kwanzaa cherry is a double pink blossom, uh, if we can get a look at that one. So here's the Kwanzaa cherry in full bloom. Like I said, we're still a couple weeks away from that. This is a tree that has a little bit smaller stature to it. You can see it's a denser, more compact growth habit. So if you're limited on space, that could be a nice addition to your garden. They're going to uh, peak out at about maybe 18, 20 feet tall, and they just don't spread out as wide. They have that more compact habit that's in there. Now, I will tell you that um, I was amazed to learn that the oldest cherry in the world is close to 2,000 years old, but it's in Japan and it's in a monastery where it's got the ideal perfect conditions and no disturbance, no urban stresses. A lot of times cherries, to me in the landscape, I look to get about 30, 40 years out of them and then that's, a, so I don't consider it to be a real long lived tree, but still for most of us, that's plenty, plenty of beauty that we can get out of them. So that's the Kwanzaa cherry and again, I'll get another little close up on the um, flower that's there. So this has that double set of petals, so it's a heavier blossom that's on there and a nice, a little bit deeper pink color. So again, if you were a little careful in your selection of cherries, you could have cherries blooming in March, April, um, maybe, well, maybe if you're lucky, extending that even to early May. So lots of cherries to choose from. Now, switching gears a little bit, I'm going to talk about red bud because these are, again, they're not flowering quite yet. I'm gonna give them another week or so, you know, so we're talking now, you know, going into maybe the second week of April. Uh, again, all this driven by weather, but this is the red bud. Uh, it's a native tree, native throughout Virginia and the area. So you'll see these flowering all along the roadsides and the edge of the woods. So it's kind of what we call an understory tree. It's gonna mature at about 15 to 20 feet tall. And it does its very best where it gets a little bit of shelter from that taller canopy of trees over it, uh, but still gets enough sunlight to blossom well for you. But uh, what a great underutilized tree for the landscape. Uh, we've been really recognizing the value of this fantastic tree and getting more and more varieties of it developed and introduced into the landscape. So this is just our native eastern red bud, Circus canadensis, but let me show you some of the neat things that we're doing with it in the plant breeding range. Flower color. Uh, we have one that's up here, it's called sort of an Appalachian red. Uh, which is there you always wonder it's called red bud it, but it tends to have this sort of magenta pink color but now we're getting some of these red tones into it and there's also what we sometimes call a white bud or white flowering one so you have a choice of flower color but even I think it's just as exciting or more exciting as a lot's being done with leaf color so when we see these different varieties coming up here with the different leaf color See if we can get this next picture going. Uh, we've got forest pansy up top, which has that deep burgundy. One that's called um, silver cloud is variegated. Uh, the one that I'm blocking right here, they call um, hearts of gold, which tends to be yellow. And then this is one's called rising sun, where the new growth comes out this sort of apricot colored. Then it matures more to a green and or to a light yellow to a green so you actually have this variation in color as the leaf matures and these are again there's there's others that are out there so we got flower color leaf color and then real quickly here i'm going to just uh, introduce you we've got the weeping red bud i even forgot that i had that one but now i want to show you the chinese red bud so we got variations in flowers leaf colors forms and this is Chinese red bud. It's, you can see it's more of a, um, what I'm gonna call large shrub, kind of stocky in its growth. 
This particular one is called uh, Donald Egoff, developed in National Arboretum. It's a compact grower. It's going to uh, peak out anywhere from about 8 to 12 feet tall. And then this is what it looks like in the summertime after it leaves out. So again, these are all fantastic trees to add spring color, flowering all the way through April. Uh, but you just got to come down and see the whole selection. We're going to take a quick break right now. When we come back, I've got a couple more trees and then a few shrubs to add color to your garden right now at this time of year. Okay, we've talked about several trees for early spring color. Uh, now we're going to talk about a couple more trees and some shrubs. Yeah, exactly. Trying to cover as much as I can right That's now. That's right. <laughs> And while we're talking about early spring color and flowering trees, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about dogwoods, Absolutely. azaleas, and rhododendrons. Mm -hmm. Now, these are not flowering quite yet, but that's okay. The thing is, this is a great time to be planting. You go out, you select your trees, you add them to your landscape, and this is what you're looking forward to um, in another Beautiful. week to two. Uh. Oh, time oh, period. Can't exactly. wait. So that's that really is the classic um, garden combination mm -hmm. around here with right. good reason because it is so bright and it really lets us know that spring is here. So uh, you know Debbie originally I'd hoped to go out and do like a little video for this show but then the weather just did not cooperate, didn't cooperate with us. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm happy with that in a way because you know what this is really the schedule we should be in. Mm -hmm. You know I don't look for dogwoods to bloom until we get into that first and second week of April so we're, we're getting back on right. schedule this year. Uh, so that's kind of what we're looking ahead to and of course the dogwood is a native flowering tree around here uh, and it grows again in the understory right there with the red buds it, and they do their very very best in that uh, bright dappled light where they get a good morning sun that may be a little bit of shelter from the real intense heat that's out there. And they do flower first, uh, which again makes them stand out. Now what's happened, of course, dogwoods have been a part of our landscape for many, many years, uh, highly prized for good reason because it's got nice structure and stature, but really the blossoms. What you're looking at right there is a variety, it's called Cloud Nine. And what the growers will do is when they find a, a dogwood, in this case that has really prolific flowering, and this one you see is just covered with blossoms, mm -hmm. and then they'll introduce that variety. So Cloud Nine has been around a long time as a, one of the most prolific of the white flowering forms. Uh, and I'm just using it as an example because there's many other great ones out there. Uh, we're also, the next one I'm going to look at is called Cherokee Brave which again you can see kind of has that white in the center, moves its way out towards pink. Uh, again, these are just variety names and I'm emphasizing this because you can go out and you can buy just Cornus Florida, just a straight species, but you have all this variation. You have really no assurance of sort of flower color or quality that's in there. So an advantage, I'll say, of buying a named variety is you can sort of assure yourself of particular characteristics that are in there. And then there's so many of them. I just kind of give oh, you a I representative know. example. Mm. So that's Cherokee Brave. And then I thought you, everybody might be interested in seeing Plana. Plana, it's a little hard to see in here, but it's actually a double flowered dogwood. Dogwoods, their true flowers are that little rosette of yellow blossoms in the center, but they form bracts around it. Think of kind of like a poinsettia, a uh, set of modified leaves around there, which really give it the color. In this sense, this variety, plain is what we call a double flowered form. Instead of a single row of those colorful blacks, it's setting a double row of them. Uh, so again, they, these are just interesting varieties and there's uh, ones that have variegated leaves and there's ones that are getting close to true red and, and many, many others out there and they are all terrific. Beautiful. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I did want to give a little time and attention to some shrubs mm -hmm. for early spring bloom. Uh, this is a close-up of the Paris japonica or Japanese Andromeda. You can see it's in the same family as uh, azaleas and rhododendrons. The flower on there looks very much like a blueberry. So this kind of is a little bit of a clue that they're all closely related. Uh, they all like that acidic, moist, but well-drained soil. Uh, they all like to be in that sort of, you know, part sun, part shade environment. So this, this will uh, adapt also to sunny conditions. Lots of varieties that are out there. This particular one's called Mountain Fire. 
and it was developed because the new growth, uh, you can see that tender new foliage comes out sort of a fiery red. As it expands and it matures, it turns to sort of an olive green color. So I love this plant as an accent because you get early spring flowers, you get uh, interest that can go on with the growth and the foliage color, and then it's also evergreen, uh, taking you through the winter time and it has nice structure. So lots of varieties, tall ones, short ones, dwarf ones that are there. Um, eventually, we're gonna see the azaleas start blooming. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is going to be probably at least another week, maybe going towards two weeks. And there's so many different azaleas. It's just you know hard to imagine and hard to give justice to all the different colors that are out there. Rhododendrons flower a little bit later. So this is a scene that I would expect to see you know towards the end of the month, maybe even to May time period. So it still fits in my spring color, uh, goes on there. So well, again, now we, we don't get to see the pretty color anymore. No, but you know, I, I didn't want to dwell on that too much because people are so familiar with azaleas and rhododendrons, but I want to share a couple thoughts about their care and their culture that They're goes right. on. Mm. I said they like that deep, rich, acidic, but well-drained soil. Sometimes if you can get a real close-up look at this, this what we call intervenal chlorosis is a pretty common disorder. And what's distinctive on that, uh, if we can go back to that other picture in just a minute, the one right there is the veins are a dark green, but it's turning yellow in between. Okay, so keep that picture in mind. Now let's go to our next one. Now this one, again, the leaves are turning yellow, but as we call a stippled pattern. It's a bunch of little spots and specks that are on there. And if you were to flip the leaf over and look on the underside, you see the little black specks that are occurring in there. So even though the symptoms are similar, they're two different problems. What you're looking at right there is an insect pest. It's called azalea lace bug, and it's a little insect that uh, sticks its mouth in there and it sucks the sap out of the leaf tissue, and it gives it that kind of speckled or stippled look at it. So that's something there, there's usually three to four generations a year. They kind of hatch out and start feeding, let's say in, let's see, go this way. They start doing their feeding in April, then they continue in May, June, July. Their populations build up and become quite a problem by late summer. So if you're seeing that, you can treat with this um, bear, tree and shrub, protect and feed. It's a systemic insecticide you put in the ground, it's absorbed up through the roots, and that one application will take care of the problem and last anywhere from one to two years. Great. And on that uh, iron chlorosis? Right. If it's the other one where you have sort of where the veins are green but it's going yellow in between, that's a nutritional problem. And really what the plant's telling us is it's not getting sufficient iron. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you run into that type of problem, uh, you basically correct it by applying iron to the soil. So you could use either the iron sulfate or the fast-acting iron. They're both good products and both will give you pretty rapid results. So if you're out there looking around your garden, enjoying spring color, take a close look and if you see any of those problems, here's some easy ways to fix it. Absolutely. And as always, if you've got any questions, bring a sample into our experts at, at any of our locations because we are there to help and we have some great experts there. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to take your phone calls. So if you have any questions, give us a call, 703-387-1046, and we look forward to talking to you. time so if you have any questions give us a call 703-387-1046 and David our first caller is Eva who's calling from Silver Spring. Hi Eva. Are you there? Yes. Hi. Uh, good morning. How good are morning. You? Um, I want to clear an area of weeds and grass for a, a wild garden okay. and I have an old area that I have vegetable which the <laughs> grass the weed took over that I want to clear. Uh, how best, what kind of best spray and how soon can I plant after that? Well, I'm going to give you two choices. Um, really, when, probably the easiest and most effective way would be to spray the area with Roundup. Uh, and you could do that this weekend when the weather's nice. Roundup is absorbed through the leaf tissue and it goes down, it kills the roots and everything. It will take about two weeks for everything to be dead. 
But the thing that I, is kind of nice with it is it degrades on contact with the soil. There's no soil residual behind. So as soon as those weeds are dead, you could clear the area and start planting your new garden. Now I realize a lot of times where you're growing your vegetables, if you just really don't want to do this with using any chemicals, then your choice there is going to just have to be physically digging it out by hand. So either one of those would give you a good results and you could start on it today. For the vegetable, I heard about the vinegar. Is that a good idea? There is a horticultural vinegar. Uh, now we, we don't sell it, it's gonna be hard to find. Uh, but what my, my concern, I might say, with that, the limitations with it, is some of these natural products like the horticultural vinegar, and we sell several others, what they do is they burn the top of the plant. They burn the leaf surface. So that plant, when you apply it, literally sometimes within hours, it's dead. So it works, or it seems to work very effectively. Uh, the problem with it is that it does not translocate down into the root system and so two, three weeks later, uh, if those per are perennial weeds, they're growing back from the root system. So that, um, it has its limitations. I mean, you'll see very fast results, you know, everybody feels good about that, but then two weeks later when the weeds are coming back, you may, um, may wish you'd done something else. What about covering the, pl the plastic? black plastic. I uh, usually do that on the, in the fall for the vegetable where I have tomato and like that and they still on until I plant them. Right, you can do that also. That's a little bit of a slow process because essentially you're relying on the heat to build up under there to kill the weeds um, and then also the blocking of the sunlight. So that's, I mean, there, there are other ways to do this but um, they all have their, their pros and cons. Uh, I got one more question, please. Okay. Uh, I have wild vines coming up from uh, uh, at the end of the garden. I got a slope going down, and there are a lot of trees there. But they're taking over. They're coming over to the grape arbor. They uh, coming to the garden where I got the vegetable. How do I kill that without killing the rest? Yeah. Uh, you may want to try to come in the store and look for what's called stump and vine killer. Now the way this works is you would go in there and with a vine, let's say you've got a wild grape that you want to eradicate or honeysuckle, you would prune it, you would cut the vine and then immediately, right away while that's cut still fresh, you drizzle this stuff or paint it onto the exposed cut or the exposed wound that way it translocates down and kills only that vine and will not kill the surrounding plants. So it would be better cut at the, because the, as they come up the slope, you know, they have uh, uh, more root. Should I cut at the, at the base, at the end, down the slope or at the top? Uh, it really doesn't matter, it'll work either way. Uh, I just go for whatever part's easy to reach. I guess if you can get towards the base of the vine, it might give you a little better results. But really, we've done this, um, and you, you can cut it, you know, in the middle, or you can cut it near the base. Either way, it should give you good results. And it won't uh, arm the trees. No, it does not. It only kills the the plant where you apply it. So if you apply it to the tree, that's a problem. But if you just apply it to the vine, um, then it will not harm the tree. Okay. Thank you, Okay. Ava. Thanks Thank for you. the call. Have a great weekend. Bye bye. Okay. Let's see. Annie is calling from Springfield. Hi, Annie. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I have a about an eight foot fig tree, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to know when's best to um, trim it or cut it shorter because I haven't been getting uh, as a prolific uh, fig uh, abundance in the last few years. And also, how to fertilize it? What to fertilize it with? Okay. Now, is it getting plenty of sunlight? Yeah. Where, where you have it planted? Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, figs don't require a lot of fertilizing, uh, but you could fertilize them now at this time of year, uh, either with something like, you know, plant tone, which is an organic fertilizer, or the Maryfield flower food. Uh, that could help it along in its fruit set. Now, the thing with figs, there's a couple different ways of growing them. Uh, there, sometimes there's what we call a first set of fruit. There are buds that overwinter that are supposed to give you your first set of fruit. So if you prune it back now, uh, which you may still want to do, 
uh, since you're not really getting any fruit. But if you prune it now, you are sacrificing that first set of fruit, but it allows time for the plant to regrow, regenerate, and then give you that second set later in the season. So because yours is not really producing that well, I would say that's probably a good thing for you to go in, uh, prune it right now, thin out you know, some of the older branches, maybe reduce it in size a little bit, fertilize it, and then look to get some figs towards late summer. Good, because I've never really trimmed it that much, and it's about uh, 30 years old. Right. Just realize that normally we'll get an early set and then a late set of fruit. You're sacrificing the early one to kind of rejuvenate the plant, but hopefully we'll still have some figs for you by the end of summer. Thank you so much. I really enjoy your program. Oh, well, thank, thank you so much you. for watching and giving us a call. Thank have you. A, bye have bye. a great have day. Bye-bye. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to Rita. So hang in there, Rita. We'll be right back with you. Getting it right to back to our phone calls. Rita is calling from Falls Church. Thanks for holding, Rita. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you very much. What I'm uh, uh, calling for actually is um, regarding vines for pergolas. Mm -hmm. I have a pergola, and uh, for the past two years, well, three years actually, I've grown the hyacinth bean vine on there. Oh, that's nice. Yes, and, and in fact, the very first year, it was so uh, full of blooms that I bought a photograph to you at, uh, where you are. In fact, I gave it to you. Oh. And, uh, but it's only um, an annual, that. What, I would like something that's more permanent, but I, I don't want, uh, I, I don't think I want the wisteria because I've heard that the roots on that are very aggressive and that they tend to grow sometimes underneath the patio base. Yeah, I would agree with that. You don't want to use wisteria. Uh, so you get a fair amount of sun, it sounds like. Um, yes and no. I don't have any trees in my yard, but there are trees in the other gardens around me. So, but I do get a very good fair amount of sun, yes. Mm. Now, are you familiar with what's called cross vine? Cross vine, yeah. no. Uh, that, that's the first one that comes to mind uh, to me. It's a native vine, Bignonia is the uh, genus on that. And what happens, uh, cross vine, it does flower for us more towards, uh, let's say, June time period. The yeah. flower looks very much like a trumpet vine, but it's not oh, as aggressive yeah. or invasive. And you can get a choice of colors. You in, it's usually in kind of that yellow, orange kind of a range. Uh -huh. And around here, it's classified as a semi-evergreen, which means it's gonna lose most, but maybe not all of its foliage in the winter time. And it goes a deep burgundy color in fall. So to me, you've got um, a vine that's that's native, so it's not going to be as invasive or aggressive as some of the others. Yeah. Uh, you get a bloom and you get a little bit of winter interest in it. So I would say that's definitely one to consider. Uh, and, and now if I came, do you sell this? Oh, we do. Okay, yeah. and I would just ask for cross vine. Right. You might call in to make sure we have it in stock because a lot of times uh, people buy, wait until they're flowering to buy them. But uh, we, we should have it in stock, but you might give us a phone call first. Oh, okay, fine. And is there another one as, as well? Uh, uh, I guess what I'm thinking is I, I don't it? really like, I'm not a big fan, like you said, of wisteria or even the trumpet vine. Uh, but it sounds like you might also be successful with a uh, climbing hydrangea. Uh, oh, the climbing wow. hydrangea does not do well in really hot, exposed areas. But if you get a little bit of um, shade from your neighboring trees, then that's one that could also do well for you. It is an early spring bloomer. It flowers first in the spring, and then it starts to put out its leaves and continue to grow. Okay, well, fine. Thank you very much. I'm coming to your rose thing tomorrow, so I'll check hey. on the oh, Good. While you're there, ask about the climbing hydrangea and cross vine. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Good Thanks to hear for from the call. you. Bye bye. Okay, let's see. Eve is calling from Stafford. Hi, Eve. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Good We're morning. doing great. What can we do for you? Well, I have a question about uh, the cherry blossom trees. Yes. We have about seven. Seven of the cherry, Kwanzaa cherry blossom trees blooming along our driveway, 
and they're very beautiful. They've been there about uh, 10 years or more, so they're fairly mature. But at the base of a couple of the trees, they have some wounded areas. I don't know whether they've been injured by uh, a string trimmer or whether it's a borer, but the sap sort of oozes out there, and I don't know what we should put on it to protect those trees. Right. Well, and that's kind of the things I alluded to a little bit earlier with cherry trees because they do get, uh, they're vulnerable to a number of different insect and diseases uh, that I don't consider a really long-lived tree in the landscape. But still, you should get another 25 years out of these trees. Um, so you're exactly right. You know, it could be a wound caused by a string trimmer or something. It could be a wound that's a result of a borer. Um, generally, that, that oozing of the sap is the tree's defense system at work. It's sort of trying to protect and seal that wound, so I don't want to disturb it too much. Uh, it can also be a formation of a canker that's back there. Ultimately, try to take a really close look. If you see little holes, cracks, or splits in there, then it very well could be what's called the peach tree borer, which is a very destructive pest. And I'm just looking, but that bare that uh, bear, tree, and shrub that protect and feed. This particular Ta-da. one, right, we happen <laughs> to have it. But this particular one that says dual action on there, um, this will control the peach tree borer, but make sure it says the uh, dual action on there. So if you see cracks and splits or little wounds, it maybe be on the safe side and treat it with this product. And that can be, that could happen right now, anytime this month. Uh, okay, and uh, we've been spraying a plum tree so that we get I, I hate to interrupt. I'm sorry, but we're totally out of time. Yeah, they're going to pull the plug <laughs> on gonna us. They're going to pull the plug on us. Thanks so much. But for we your treat call. the plum the same way. They're close relatives. Great. Have a great weekend. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, next weekend, Peggy will be here, and we're going to be talking about container gardens. And she will be doing the seminar today at our Fair Oaks location on container gardens. And we have our Gainesville seminars today and tomorrow as well. So have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.